Jeff Cook is coming up, our next speaker. I had breakfast with him uh, yesterday, and we had a fascinating discussion about the business culture of Ohio. He's an incredibly perceptive guy, and that's always refreshing to meet someone who can see these things. Um, he's originally uh, went to the University of Toledo briefly in physics. He's also been to the University of Bowling Green. After that, he got into computers for a while, audio design and um, software testing, and then that got him evolving into management positions, and that took him full circle back to his original concept of working with physics. So here is Jeff Cook. I would like to uh, um, start with something. Uh, if I don't speak about it now, I will forget about it as I get into this. Uh, I'd like to thank Steve for inviting me to this conference. And the irony in the positioning of the speaker is because almost everything that I will be discussing today from a different angle was just discussed by Greg. And not only that, but it's, you know, it's back to back. And I've been speaking with him the entire conference. And if you get the chance, you got to speak with him. He's the sharpest guy I've met here. And, and there's a lot of intelligent people, but he just, he, he not only knows things, he understands them, and it's amazing. So um, th in this, we'll be talking about um, fields and uh, vortices and torsion. And, uh, um, but I'm not going to deal with all the topo topography and all of the other math. I, in fact, there's only one way to go at this um, without making this last days of discussion, um, because the gravitational field is very complicated. The only way that I could see when I was thinking to present this in an hour's time is purely dimensional analysis, and at the end, I will present the actual equation that links to, from all the way back to the Bohr model, to Einstein, uh, to everyone, and it's something that people can measure and see that the two uh, mathematics do line up and are exactly equal. And then I, I was able to uh, build an experimental apparatus that is based on all of this. Um, the device, which will be shown um, probably about five minutes, and that's it. I can show it a little bit after uh, the discussion, but it takes just about a few minutes to show uh, the initial um, fields that are generated and some of the motions that are a bit unique, and we'll discuss that later. So largely what this is going to be is a discussion on fields, and I'm going to try to make it um, do my best to entertain myself with some uh, dry humor um, that no one else will get, but that's okay. Um, this. This concept of a gravitational field um, having to do with mass in empty space has been, goes back originally to uh, um, probably Galileo, but definitely in Newton, uh, Newton's time. Newton took 20 years before he um, published his um, polar or radial uh, gravitational field theory, and the reason is, is because it left out torsion, the torsion effects of gravity, which are, do tend to be stronger and carry on longer than the radial. Um, he never did get to that and never did publish it, but he saw that somebody else was starting to ask questions about gravity and had some ideas, and he thought, oh, this guy's going to publish it before me, so I better just publish it as it is. Therefore, we were stuck with this radial notion of gravity, that it is polar like a magnet. It, it, it really isn't anything like a magnetic field, and uh, we'll discuss all of that. The, there are going to be three fields that are discussed, electric field, magnetic field, and gravity. And um, and I will get into Einstein too. Okay, so I'm going to keep the introduction, introduction short because I know there's no way to get through this unless I don't talk. I'll just read what it is and describe at the end if you have any questions. And the way we'll do this is through baseball because just about everyone here will know at least a little bit of baseball. My wife knows absolutely nothing of baseball. She's from Europe and they don't have baseball in the country she's from. Um, I'm trying to get her into it. but. The um, baseball is very simple, but it has a lot of, uh, a lot of physics in just the simple um, uh, parameters. You got a pitcher and a catcher and just about every, and a batter, and about everything else happens secondary to that. But in that physics, it's, 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 in, it's incredible. But the game itself is simple, so we will discuss that. The universe is very complicated. The physics of baseball, it, it may be complicated, as I discussed, but the implement, implementation of physics to baseball is very easy, and it's easy to describe, and anyone can follow it. Uh, gravity, on the contrary, um, actually may be very simple. It may be something more simple than we have ever conceived. Um, 
if we get to the final result. It's, it's, I'll bring up the, S, uh, the Tesla egg of Columbus, which is, the egg of Columbus is a concept that is so, seems impossible to solve until you have it, until you have the solution. Then you see, how did we not know this before? Started with Columbus, like, can you make an egg stand on its end? You know, it always wants to fall over. Well, he did, he cracked the top and he made a little, you know, flat bottom and he can stand it up. Tesla did it with uh, um, gyroscopic equilibrium with uh, um, what's called the Tesla Egg of Columbus that he demonstrated in the World Fair. This is the inverse of that effect, but we'll get into that later. Okay. The physics of gravity um, may be just like that. Uh, the implementation of gravity to electrical mechanical technology by definition today is impossible. There is absolutely no model out there of gravity that shows that it is possible to make the Searle device. There is nothing that's going to show that gravity can be anywhere in our electrical circuits, much less this, and much less the lifters. Everything is going to fall short. There is no way to connect the dots as it is. And how can this be? I mean, it seems like it should be straightforward stuff. The electric, set, the electric static field is pretty simple. The magnetics pretty simple. Um, but really, it, it, so far as it stands, gravitational field is, is out. It's, it's a big hole in our understanding. I would say the general consensus. There may be some people that have it. I'm not saying that. Just the general consensus. We can't all agree on what it is. We don't even know what gravity is. Um, I would say we as in the scientific community. OK, so don't think me. Anyone ever see Bull Durham? OK, this is the pitcher who couldn't think, but he had this amazing skills. OK, it's just don't even think about it. Just Let's just work with baseball. OK, all I need to do is focus on this. And we get all the answers to all our physical questions, gravity and everything. We're going to just deal with the fastball, not the curveball, not the slider, just the fastball in this entire presentation. But there's a lot in it. What is the perfect fastball? In this model, it's the same as the perfect curveball or slider, so we don't need to get into that. It's where the displacement velocity equals the throw velocity. OK, we'll get into that. In this case, when you have these two equal, the spin torque of the pitcher twisting his wrist to throw the ball will, e will be greater than both the throw force and the gravitational force, but only at the very end. Where should I point this to change things? This computer? Ah, there we go. Um, this means then, of course, then the pitch displacement equals 60% of the release height. We'll get into all of these when I throw some drawings. The pitch displacement is the amount of the distance the ball moves from its original trajectory. Its release height is from about this guy's hand to the earth and uh, um, when it leaves the hand. All right, so with these parameters, we can actually begin to throw in some physical equations. The throw distance here, he reaches higher and forward, and it'll go from here to here. This distance from pitcher's mound to here is about this many meters. OK, there is an angle. And this here, this little point, this is the displacement we're interested in. It goes from here to here, 17 inches on a very good uh, fast pitch, 17 inches in the same exact amount of time, the same exact velocity as the ball goes from here to here. They are equal in a perfect fastball if you really want to, if you've got a good pitcher. OK, the pitcher doesn't know this. He just does it. But this is what happens. In this case, in this area, let's just talk in the last 40%, the torque dominance is stronger than the force of gravity, and it is stronger than the force of the throw, but only at that moment. OK, so if we take away that target down here and raise it upward, it becomes easier because we can deal with a straight line. And we have all of these distances involved, and each one of these has a different parameter of motion. The, um, this one is the one that's going to be interesting. This is our torsion. Okay, this is he throws the ball down, as it, or he throws it with his arm this way, but twists his wrist down, straight down, and it creates this spin, which only has an impact in the last 40%. Of course, in this throw, it's, it's greater. But the, this section here it is more dominant. At this point, gravity then begins to take over. The radial force of gravity, I should say. <clears throat> All right, what we do know about gravity, the force of, the, and, and this scenario that I just put up, this regular physics knows, the force of the throw fades rapidly, the torque of the spin fades less rapidly, and gravity is constant uh, since it's parallel. It's, we'll say it's relatively constant. Or constant. 
and the throw force. Let's discuss that, the throw force fading first. What is the simplest uh, way we can deal with that in pure dimensional analysis? Force equals mass times velocity divided by time. Ball's mass is constant, right? Ball's velocity is almost constant from pitcher to catcher, considering this takes faster, fastball goes there faster than a blink of an eye. So it's, we would say that it is almost significant, it's insignificantly uh, changing, so it is very constant. Time of the denominator, if the force diminishes, must be increasing significantly. There are only these parameters involved in that throw force to make the ball go forward in the simplest uh, uh, manner describing. That gives a time parameter that changes. Spin torque fades next. The torque is, a, um, is a, a vector. It has the same parameters as energy. We'll get in and discuss with that. Here are the uh, dimensions. We got distance times mass times velocity divided by time. The spin of the ball, mass ball is constant. Spin velocity is reasonably constant. Time in the denominator is increasing from the, the last of the force. That also must be carrying over to be a decreasing parameter. And the displacement, r in the numerator, is also increasing with torque, which causes it to fade slower over time than the throw. Okay, we know this is the same, it has the same parameter as the force. It is definitely decreasing. But if for this to fade, this also needs to be decreasing, or increasing. We will get into what that is in a minute. All right. Earth's gravity is constant. That force can be described as mass times velocity divided by time. Ball's mass is constant. Ball's terminal velocity is relatively constant since it's going horizontally. If it was falling in a descending manner, it would be a little bit different. Thus, the time in the denominator must also be constant. We're not going to be interested in this at this point. We're more interested in the torque, which we'll get to. All right, time is inverted frequency, which you all know. Uh, constant time makes no sense, though. Time has the tendency to be always moving forward. If the best way to represent any time frequency that is staying the same in an equation is basically refer to it as the frequency, where it can maintain that constant. Is better represented as absolute. Okay, thus, we can represent this description here as force divided by mass times velocity. This is basic physics. The constant frequency between the energies, we refer to energy as U because we will refer to E as electric field. And the Earth is as unique as, ah, yes. The, this frequency is unique to every mass. This frequency is unique to every object in space, and it is more, frequency, it is more constant than the mass itself. All right, the last thing we do know, um, pretty much last, torque of the ball spin has the same physical dimensions as in energy, which I discussed, but torque is unquantized. Energy is quantized, and um, torque is a vector, and it has one increasing time parameter in its denominator. Energy is quantized and scalar. It's got frequency. Its time is not even that second there that's seconds divide, you know, to power of minus two, one of those in there must be a frequency if it's constant. We can't discuss it as anything else in this scenario. This allows us for Planck, Planck's constant divided by time equals energy. Has the same physical dimensions as angular momentum. Again, Planck's constant is constant. It is, it is involved in quantum relationships. Angular momentum, not. But for that angular momentum to have play in the dimensions of torque, knowing that mass and the spin velocity is constant or approximately constant, some distance from all pitch parameters minus the displacement must decrease throughout the pitch. And I think I mentioned the uh, distance before that we were going to talk about. We, we don't know, there is no physical model, what that distance is. Now, um, this is where I will discuss cr briefly. Um, Greg, in his last discussion, had mentioned that um, Einstein's E equals mc squared does not have a rotational uh, parameter in that. And uh, there are some other um, theories coming out now that do have that. It is the same exact sense. There is no rotational uh, vector, and we'll get into that. But we don't currently know, we don't have a consensus of what that is. <coughs> Let's 
excuse me, and the other thing that is quite important that we don't know is what is the governing force of gravity that allows nature to know which end of the ball is furthest away from the Earth's center of gravity. And such properties are quantized for magnetic and electric fields. That question right there will make more sense when we describe this distance direction vector, or vice versa. Now, to clarify that last point, New Newtonian physics explained the ball is displaced from a spin because every um, action has an equal and opposite reaction. Wright brothers discovered, well, one thing, that they, there was no science in what they were working on. There was nothing in literature for what they were trying to figure out. But they did find out on their own that the airspeed under the wing can be different from that above it, depending on physical dimensions and movement. Um, but how, if the ball, well, this, is, this is easier to understand with a Frisbee than it is a baseball. Um, with some scientific models, you say one is concave, one is convex, the charge can you know, be applied in one area, and there's many other descriptions for that. But for a spherical object, it becomes confusing in our physical model, even though a sphere is one of the more simple um, objects that we can think of. If the mass of the ball is evenly distributed all around its center, what is the governing physical microscopic or macroscopic parameter that tells the air which end is up? There is nothing that we can discuss. You know, I've heard a lot of different descriptions of, well, it could be that, it could be the motion, it could be that the ball is spinning this way and therefore it knows this, but really it, it all falls short with, because there's no math to back it up. There's only questions and ideas we can hypothesize about it, but there is nothing lock solid that says which end of the ball is up. Therefore, how can this airspeed be different on the top and the bottom? How would the air know which is the top or the bottom? It relies on that, that direction and distance vector, which is not accounted for. Okay, this is where it even gets more confusing. We would have had it if it didn't come to this acceleration-based gravity field. Now, it, it, it works. It's right. But it does cancel out a few things. All right, it cancels out this issue. It doesn't have that radial um, uh, issue. Well, um, so, uh, rotational application. While such relativistic equations are valid, they can't explain the, the curveball. So. All right, so the only way to go through this is just to show it. I'm going to show all of these things. This was basically the introduction. I'm going to show it because it was me going through these one by one before I actually saw this. If I just look at it, it means nothing. But if you go through this, in this pattern, I'm going to do very quickly. So I will put this up on my website later if you want to go through it. I'm not going to describe any of the math other than the general meaning of it. Okay? You just got to go through it. All right. I'm going to create some laws here. Okay? They're not to say they can't be broken. It's just ones that have not been broken yet by any other fields. Okay? This first law. Field must consist of an interaction, a force on a given mass. Okay, it doesn't matter how big it is, doesn't matter how far it is, um, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the universe. There must be some interaction between it. Okay, it also includes that a dipole and both a scalar vector potential must be in that field. Law two: the interaction must involve torque on a dipole in the field. Law three: the curl vector times the dipole moment must be equal to the scalar potential, and that same curl vector times the vector potential must be equal to the field. Prove the law of fields. I'll go through the electric, magnetic, and Einstein's gravitic field to describe that this does, all does carry through. There's a little catch with the gravity, though. All right, result of the law of the fields, then we get some force. There, now, the, in my model, there's a lot of negatives and positive. This, however, is standard um, physics, okay? That this must be negative scalar potential, okay? And my model just expands the negatives and positives so that there's that in every single parameter. So you know so that negative sign shows which way something is curling, or if it's curling this way, it's positive, this way, um, negative. Um, distances are negative and positive. Um, all of these so that it can describe even the quantum are positive and negative, but it doesn't mean that one's negatively charged, one's neg positively charged. Dimensional fundamentals. Okay, this is, this is why we're gonna, the way we're going to describe it. All physical parameters, this is a known proof, can be expressed by different combinations of distance, time, charge, mass, and temperature. They are the most fundamental. I will not be dealing with temperature. It's statistical and it has nothing to do with what we're working on right now. Uh, da, da, da. All right, we're going to go through the proofs of the electric field. Allows, what is electric field? Allows the interaction of two electrical charges. Okay? Here we have the simplest, uh, simplest description for law one. Q is charge, 
P is electric dipole moment. All right, all the dimensions carry through. The electric dipole moment, what is it? It is the separation of positive and negative charges. I do not believe, and I know I probably get a little heat from this, I do not believe that Searle is passing electrons from the center of his device through the dielectric material. I believe that it is a dipole. Okay, now whether that affects electrons to the outside, possibly, but to my knowledge, and somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, it's not doped, it's not a semiconductor, it's, it's dielectric. Electrons cannot pass through it. What it does is it creates electric field, it's a plate. And a dipole is created instantaneously on the opposite side of the plate. This is a standard capacitance uh, a model, but in, in essence, that's what my difference is on that, but everything else is the same. Um, that is what a, a dipole, electric dipole is, is separation of positive and negative charges. Curl is a vector consisting of a directional component. I changed the font, so it's kind of going down here. Um, and that, that's what curl is. It's a directional and distance component. Um, let's see. First law, it's the interaction of charges, the dimensions do carry over. Electric dipole is well defined, we know it very well, is demonstrated at every capacitor on the market today. The scalar potential is the charge itself, vector potential is known as voltage. First law works for the E field. Second law, all of these dimensions carry over, like I said, I'm going to skip this. Yes, it does work for torque, it has torque on a dipole in electric field. Curl times dipole does equal the, the charge or the scalar potential. Yes, all of the third laws work for the E field as well. You've got curl times the voltage. So what? Try to just kind of observe. Like I said, I'm going to go quick on this. Electric, the electromagnetic field allows the interaction of two electric currents. Right? Same exact setup as the electric field, just uh, different dimensions. But you do have your magnetic dipole. And, ooh, let's go back now. What is a magnetic dipole? It is basically an electrical coil. Okay, the, the simplest way we can describe a magnetic dipole is an inductive coil. Okay, it's the circulation of current. They have not found, um, the standard is that we don't know of this being in the atom, but there is this discussion that we just had prior with Volk and that, that this is, this is right there where it is. It's a circuit. The atom itself is a circuit. This dipole is in there. The dipole is the electric circuitry. The induction, what do we have here? All right, first law, B field does carry over. We all know this. The interaction of two currents is well defined. We use it um, in electric coils. This is a scalar potential, it's vector potential to A. We do know this very well. Um, it all carries over. The third, second law works well. Yes, there is torque on a magnetic dipole in a magnetic field. Third law, yes, it does work. Dimensions do carry over. All right. Continuing, curl times the vector magnetic potential do equal the B field. This, this works. So far, all of these laws work for those two fields. All right, again, I've got to show you two more things. Can we treat mass as a scalar potential? We treated charge as a scalar potential in electric field. We treated current as um, the uh, scalar potential in the uh, um, uh, magnetic. But can we do it with mass? Newton did, Einstein did, can we do that? All right, well, Einstein did, and this is what he said it would look like in a different way. This is very simple what he said. This is the gravitational field. Allows the interaction of two masses. This was actually Newton originally, but gravitation of dipole moment would be the separation of masses as an aircraft moves away from uh, the Earth. That's why we represent the force of gravity as negative. Okay, it is the opposite, but we are not talking necessarily force, but this is the gravitic dipole moment would be the separation of the measurement of the separation of two masses. First law, does it work? Yes, it does, okay, it carries over. Do we get a dipole out of it? Yes, we do. In the baseball example, it would still carry over. Scalar potential would be mass, yes, it works. Second law, yes, we would have our dipole, I'll just call it X dipole. But what happens, meters per second squared, that's acceleration. It's saying that the gravitational field is nothing more than acceleration. This is essentially what Einstein said. Is there anything wrong with that? Not necessarily, but watch. This even works over. All right, we got our dipole times the curl equals the uh, um, mass or our scalar potential. All right. In our field, where's our mass? The electric field had mass in it. 
our, our magnetic field had mass in it. In fact, what we're discussing is the interaction of masses at any given distance in space. How can we not have mass in there? This M stands for distance. It's not, it's not kilograms, okay? It just canceled out, all right? But it's, it still works, but it's not there. Are we at the point? No. Does mass need to be there? Is it even important? Is it really necessary? I mean, is this just law I pulled out of my butt? No, probably not, but let's see. But can we make a T field, a time field, all right? Let's just go out on a whim. Can we continue this process for, through anything? Field laws do work for this, all right? And the vector potential of a time field, now, I don't believe in a time field, okay? I'm just showing as example. It would give the vector potential as power, and, and, and here's the dimensions for it. But mass is still in the dimensions of time field. Mass is in, I can carry out any uh, possibility through these laws, and I'll find that mass is in every single one of these fields. I can create a distance field. I can create any field using any parameters, except gravity. All right, this is why it's impossible, because it canceled out. Why is mass special? It's not. It just cancels. Force itself is the involvement of the movement of mass, all right, by definition. By trying to describe the movement of mass by the mere existence of mass in space, we get nothing but space. Isn't it true? Yes, it is. But that's all it says. One plus one equals one plus one. A dog is a dog. That gives me nothing. It doesn't give me a product. It doesn't say that E equals MC squared. It just says mass equals mass. It's, it's, not, it's useless. Therefore, we can't make any model. We can't design any technology based on it because it may not even be the real interaction of the force itself. It may not even be an interaction of mass. Now here's the point. We can do it. We can redefine it to have different dimensions. And everything will carry over in the same. All right, let's start it out. Um, we have to do a new law then. We need to say that mass needs to be there. All right, the, the scalar potential must be a component of the vector potential as well as the field itself. Therefore, mass must be in there if we're going to use it as a scalar potential. It's not, so therefore, we're creating new laws so we can't do that anymore. This works for all the fields described, except for the so-called interacting masses. Even Newton's formula, while it does give, give the, the constant g in the equation, it doesn't give us a gravitational field, which I believe is what stumped him on finishing his documentation. What would be the scalar potential if not mass? Well, actually, it could be anything if you want to use your creativity. You could you can work it all out. But what we want to do is go down to the simplest parameter that is constant, that we know about, that we can work with, that we're used to working with. What we get, the most simple, is about charge squared. All right? We will call this charge squared inertience. All right? Charge is already present in the EMB field, so we know a lot about it, so we can work with it. It's constant. And uh, um, it was one of the, the first big mysteries we solved in physics. Okay, we need to do constant other than g, Newton's g, all right? If we're gonna use something other than mass, we need to have another constant. It's very easy to do, okay? We just solve for w. We uh, use some arbitrary masses, arbitrary distances. Here's how we do it. By using, this is how one could do it, okay? This is how I did it. The gravitational interaction between two electrons at an arbitrary distance. So we just set it at like 100 meters or something, and then we can cancel them out and we get our value. The distances cancel out in such a rate. This is the value if you use the scalar potential as charge squared. This is the value in replacement of g. It will give you the same exact um, measurements as using interaction of two masses and a gravitational force. All right, so then we can continue on to describe the gravitational field. It allows the interaction of two or more inert particles. Why inert particles? Because if a charge electron is coupled with a proton, we have zero net charge. We can call that inert in that sense, okay? Why would be the state of being inert? We would call it inertia. So there has been some study with heart defibrillation and things of that nature where somebody has um, described the flow with a, a concept of inertia. It's very good if you happen to be interested in medical. So there is already that concept out there. We will describe it as charge squared, and we will call it inertia, okay? We will use the same x. Here we have our, um, the same description as we did for all the other fields. The gravitic dipole, which we will um, describe now, will be the measurement of the separation of inert particles and or molecules. I believe this is the same thing as transmutation. I believe it is the same effect that is occurring in Hutchison. 
Okay, I don't have any proof for it, it's just a hunch, but it is definitely, by definition, of what we're doing here, the separation of inert particles and or molecules. The dipole is. All right, the first law, does it work out? The interaction of two inert particles, yes it does, we get our universal constant, gravitic dipole, separation, all right. We have all of those elements ready to go, so we can we then go see if it all carries over the dimensions. Yes, we do, we would get that torque, and here are the dimensions. The end field, we would have the dimensions of this. It would no longer be simply a, an acceleration in there. You would have your mass times distance per time squared per charge squared. That is the gravitational field in this model. Third flaw, third flaw, third law for the end field. Does it work? Yes, it does. All the dimensions carry over. It's actually simpler than the Einstein uh, approach. Third law for the end field. We'll just call it O. Oh, this is not zero. I'm running out of uh, running out of symbols and variables. Here we go. Yes, the dimensions do carry over, and it's very beautiful. And what does it tell us? The the end field is, is simply force divided by inertia, and the um, scalar potential inertia is a component of both the electrogravitational field and the electrogravitic potential. The fourth law works in this system, and this one only. Therefore, we can unify the magnetic electrogravitic field. What is the gravitational field? It is nothing more than electric field per charge. Also, the electric field carries over into being nothing more than magnetic field times a velocity or a vector drift, which will be discussed uh, on my website, not here. <coughs> now, Plasma physics has discussed this um, already, uh, plasma, plasma Physics 101. This is the force, which I was describing, how it comes into play. The particle drift on a, on, on a gravitational field times a charge, in my model it is the positive charge, times the magnetic field equals the force of gravity. This is from the books, all right? But with that, we get our dimensions and actual values of the gravitational field in the atomic model. Here we have the gravitational field in SI units is the gravitational force divided by the charge of the electron times the charge of the proton, which also equals the force of the gravity times the electric field divided by the charge of the electron times the electrostatic force in the atom. These two forces cancel, and we do get the electric field divided by charge. The dimensions carry over, and we get our same concept of being force per inertia. <clears throat> now, where does the technology come in? If you do the math, that gravitational field, all it equals is capacitance inverted, which comes into play with the um, Brown, um, Townsend, Brown, and uh, um, asymmetric capacitors a large number of the phenomena. In fact, the waveform that I will be pulsing this device is asymmetric square wave, which creates that asymmetric capacitance. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's inverted if it's asymmetric, but this is one of the um, areas that is involved. All right, this has already been in implemented right here with the Tesla Egg Columbus. Has anyone seen this? kind of dropped off the face of the earth. There's not many people have seen it. There are, if you do a Google search on the Tesla Egg of Columbus, you'll see it. He used it at the World Fair. You'd think these things would be last, leave lasting imprints on us, but it hasn't. But it, it uh, is essentially the same thing I'm going to show you here, although I discovered this on my own, and it is inverted from this. Now what he has is this copper um, egg shape in the center. We've got to look at the top view. And his toroid co coil, um, which are separated, there's four of them and he pulses it and creates a rotational magnetic field. The um, egg then gyrates and comes up on its end. It stands on its end in a spinning manner. He used it to describe AC motors and some of the uh, um, properties of them. All right, it's called gyroscopic equilibrium. All right, it's got stationary toroid coils, alternating current, rotating magnetic field, copper egg in the middle, and the egg stands on the end. It's essentially what it does. All right. With all this discussed, what is that mystery distance? It's an angle reduction, okay? We need that rotational component in there. If we're gonna deal with E equals MC squared, in this concept, we need to have a rotational distance. This 
is going to come into play with how the ball knows which end is up. All right, here's the details of that. The pitcher throws the fastball in one direction. Just before the release, the force of the spin is directed toward the Earth's center of gravity, which causes torque with direction. The ball contains many inert particles, all right, they're not charged, that are um, each affected in unison with that initial torque, all right? This creates a single directional line of inertia. It is in the opposite direction of where that torque is applied. Or I'm not gonna say opposite, I'm gonna say 100 degrees, like I originally said. Okay. So here's the angle reduction. He throws the ball down. This is the line of inertia here in, the, in a fast pitch. The line of inertia will be different for a curveball, but it's always 100 degrees away from the angle. This um, inertia line has some interesting properties that can be experimentally tested to prove that it actually is there. It's not just something coming from theory, okay? Um, and the interesting aspect of it is that, um, here I'll just read it, 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 it's, it affects how the particles can be uh, interacting with that um, line. It has to do with angle, just as um, Greg had just discussed. With those two angles, you can tell where every point, every coordinate is, and therefore you can tell how it interacts. It is that inertia line, that angle reduction that comes into play with this. The inertia line from the individual air molecules are not affected by the ball's inertia line when the ball is between the reducing angle. Therefore, if this is the ball, the inertia line is here, the Earth's center of gravity is here, the air particles are not affected by that inertia line. It cannot see it. Okay, it's affected, it's distracted by another line of inertia, which has more to do with the ball's dimensions itself. Therefore, the airspeed is different in that sense. This causes time to slow. This has to do with gravity. The only thing that can affect the time to speed up or slow down is gravity. Thus, an increase in air velocity under the ball. This is called lift. And it is charge related in this model. This is all governed with differences in time. When time is slowed on one side of an object, there is a net force applied in the opposite direction. This is the same exact thing in this model as an asymmetric capacitor. When you have a positive charge and a negative charge, an asymmetric capacitor, there's a time discrepancy and there is a net force towards one um, uh, plate. Time is governed by gravitational fields. Gravitational fields are governed by inertia. Inertia is the product of charge. Torque can be additive. This is where the free energy comes in. Um, and torque can be additive. Power is energy per time, but if we have a time changing time parameter, we can get more power to load in a shorter amount of time, which will give over unity without altering any of the laws of thermodynamics. But one cannot reduce the time in the denominator of energy because it is quantized. Torque, however, is additive, not quantized, has the same dimensions as energy, and time in the denominator of velocity of molecules caught in a gravitic field decreases both theoretically and experimentally when in proper alignment with inertia. This um, also, I will say really quickly while I'm noting that this can be called being in resonance or harmonic if the angles are matching, okay? It has to do with phase angle. Right. Thus, the power can be increased with the same amount of input torque. How? You invert Tesla's egg of Columbus. Now, there's a coil that I came up with. I will describe it um, after because a lot of people here will already know about it. If not, you can do, you can do a, um, a Google search on it. But um, basically, there are a number of things that I found with it. In, in essence, it is, the, um, it is a way to invert a toroid. It's like the same properties of a torus um, or a tor or toroidal uh, magnetic field, but it's the, it's the inverted. It's the one divided by that field. And there you get the description of this, this coil, and I'll describe how to make it in a short moment. All right, so instead of focusing on the center, Egg of Columbus, we, and, and the uh, um, one velocity, which is the speed of the rotation of that egg, um, and uh, reducing time component, we expand around the outside of it. So we have many spinning parameters around the outside. And then we can make this radius as wide as we want and keep adding more of these spinning devices. Those spinning devices can be magnets spinning and inducting uh, magnetic induction to other things. It doesn't matter what our load is. If, it doesn't matter if it's very weak. If we have all the room from the center to the outside of the universe to keep adding these things on, it's going to be additive. Okay? And it does not matter. It does not change from the power input. I will demonstrate that in a minute. Good, we're done. 
I will need, I guess, I guess a quick volunteer, because um, some of this is not going to be visible from everyone's uh, point of view. So a volunteer of somebody I have not met yet. Yes, OK, please, come. Um, I need water, too. All right, so. I need a microphone. I'll just let you use this. Could you describe? I'll let you describe what is involved in a minute. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Describe the motion. Okay, I see a cylinder inside. Of Magnetic field over there that is rotating on itself. And staying put in one place. Okay. Okay, it keeps rotating at high speed, medium speed, and it's just sitting there in one place. Tell you what, how about if we use this one? Thank you. I don't see any other moving parts from my point of view. Now we added a magnet up right on top. This is what happened. When he moves the magnet on top of it, I mean that cylinder just moves back and forth as well. Sorry, my way file is over. Let me play it again. Why don't you quick describe uh, while we have no sound, basically what you saw there, um, and I'll get this playing again, okay? Okay. Um, there's a cylinder about the size of an inch height, and that cylinder rotates by itself. On top of copper. He's trying to get it to rotate again by moving it around. I'll tell you the problem is there is not a good signal coming out of the laptop. I use a sound blaster sound guard, even though it's ampl amplified. Um, it doesn't turn on since I've been at the conference. I've been trying to solve it. I can get it started once I once I get it. So that's what's going on here. With that. Okay, it's trying to start. There it goes. Now it's spinning again. I'll come around this way. Okay. How many watts? The number is below there. Uh, one. Just under Just, 100. Yeah, 100. Okay, 100 watts. It needs 100 to actually start on its own. Okay, I'm just under 100. Step back around. Okay, it's going to about 450. The numbers below. Okay, 50. 50, some 53. We're back to 100 watts right Let's now. Start it. And it started right now, it goes down to. I'll do it there because I'm having problems with this anyway. Okay, it's about 45 something. Has the spin been affected by the uh, power? My waveform stopped. Now it's spinning. Has the spin decreased by the power change? It did not. 
Okay. Spinning at the same speed. All right, I will, I will cue you in. Uh, I'm giving it 40 hertz, okay? A waveform. This spins at 40 hertz. It is locked, okay? It has nothing to do with the power. The power is only to set it into motion and then it drops off. Therefore, there is no real power going to the coil. It is reactive power only. It is not actually traveling from here to here, okay? But this is still moving at the same velocity. All right, maybe we want to bring one more. Thank you. Sure. Um, anyone else that I haven't met? Just one more. Mm. Would you like, maybe? We'll just make it quick. There's not much more to see than that that I will I'll show you in a second. Okay, you can use the magnet. You can feel free. It's not going to hurt you any, by any means. Uh, the cylinder follows the magnet around wherever the magnet's at it. The cylinder continues to spin. I take the magnet off, it still continues to spin. Okay, my waveform's done. Okay, I just made short waveforms here that I'm playing. I re they have to repeat it. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. It's, uh, jumped in. You're good. Okay. Thank you. That was enough confirmation, I think. Okay. So basically, what it is, a quick give a rundown. We have what is called the cook coil underneath. All right. It is iron windings at a ratio to the copper windings of five to one. So there's a thousand turns of iron windings, galvanized iron windings. Is everyone hearing that? Okay. Um, that's all described on the end of the setter, and I'll be able to describe it here. Okay, and then after, uh, I'll give that in a second, okay? It's just basically my name, I'll, I'll, dot com, but I'll give it to you in a minute. All right, this device, the magnet on the bottom, now you see the magnet affects it, but it's significantly further away from the magnet. The magnet's actually the bottom. It's one inch and uh, one and an uh, eighth inch um, width and diameter. It is tilted at a certain angle. I might come back here. It is tilted at a certain angle that cannot be changed if you want to have optimum um, performance. Not only that, but what the way it's working is I send this pulse that is asymmetric at 40 hertz. That's a square wave. And it will alter the lines of interference of where the, the direction of the spin is going to go. Therefore, if it is not in this optimum range, it won't spin, or it'll vibrate, or it will um, move to the side, many different things. Tesla found that his was around 35 to 45 um, hertz. Mine is around that same region because I'm using roughly the same radius. If I were to change the radius, that angle would change. Okay, but the tilt of the magnet that is spinning, it is not spinning perfectly round, it is oblique. It is tilting more like this. There's minimal friction. Most of that noise you're hearing is from um, magnets in the center vibrating, which I use a replaceable. If I hold those down still or tighten them down, it's completely silent almost. In fact, I'll show that really quick. No, I close out the file. I won't do that right now. I can show you afterwards. I'll, I'll be set up in the outside in a little while. All right, so other than that, what I have is then I spin it. The purpose of this device is experimental only, so that I can make changes at intervals of magnetic force that I am aware of well of, that are testable, of power input that is testable. I can add more of these devices spinning. I can create a hundred of them around if I could fit them in there. And it's an experimental device to check every single aspect of the atom. Every field is characterized in this device, except one which I'm about ready to show you. When I get the spinning, I'm not going to worry about it at this point, but I will pulse it, but I'm not going to worry about that. Th yeah, yeah, let me get a good one. I got to find that file. Hold on one second.
Take note of the color at this point. The color, when it is at the optimum range, is blue to purple. If it is offset, it will go to a different frequency. If it goes higher than its optimum, it will start to go white shift, or you know, to, to the whiter. It will go from purple into white and eventually fade out. If, so that you will see no sparks at the end. So you, therefore, you see the light is being positioned at that certain frequency that is ideal for rotation, the rotational field. The other thing, if I go the opposite way, if I slow it below 40 hertz, it, begins, it becomes red shifted and then eventually fades out to nothing. Um, with this setup with audio, I can only get about 10 hertz, so it fades, but it fades out to red quite quickly. Um, I don't have a wave file set up for that right now, but I can show anyone if you want to see. Essentially what it is, is, is a rotational field, a rotating magnetic field. You have your electric field and you do have your torsion field applied in there. And with that, you are able to get more power out than power in. And, um, and that was demonstrated only by cutting in half with one of those. Um, I was wondering if you could yes. take one more second and demonstrate it now that we got it on the screen for everybody to see. Yeah, sure. Uh, where's the other mic? I just, yeah, OK. Yeah. OK, yeah, sure, no problem. I will. Yeah, just once more, Yeah, because we're going to see if we can put Put that on the screen because a lot of the folks couldn't see it there. Ah, okay. All right, let's do it again then. Is that all right with everybody? It just take a second. Okay. Just, like I said, if I had my sound blaster sound card, I'd have this thing working a lot better. Last time I used the audio waves for this, but uh, all right. Got damaged a little bit. The flight is not making a good contact. Hold on one second. Yeah, it's not making a good contact. Now, well. No, it's not contacting. All right, this is the best I'm gonna do it. There is some damage to this device on the plane. I apologize, so it's not meeting the electrical contact very good. But where is the camera coming in? I can move out of the way for the. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There's a good view of it. So yeah, it's at 40 hertz there. So I can make a number of these. I can apply them around here. And there is a ring that is holding it into position. Without that ring, it will rotate around the rim. There are some videos uh, on the internet, I'll give you those too afterwards, which shows them a, a number of magnets rotating around this without falling out. Okay, I have this on only because this is not working with effect. This is a separate motor powering it. But essentially, this will stay towards the center if it's properly aligned. Okay. And I'll get one video of it with the motor on. With the, uh, um, you'll want to stand back a little bit. Go with this. There's no way to fix it. It's already, I've, I spent all weekend trying to get it going. It's okay. okay I'm, I have um, done a number of videos um, before I brought this device. When it, before it hit the plane, I knew I needed to get some videos before I got on the plane. Uh, so it will show all of this, what you've just seen, but, and, and you know, more system because I'm able to edit out the bad stuff. Okay. But uh, um, that is essentially the device and, and, and representative of 
the uh, um, math that is just with the torsion fields and the power relationship. Really quick, does anyone have any significant questions other than arguments? Because I don't have energy anymore. What's that? Yeah, I will. Um, I will give it exactly um, what it is is doing. The um, I have AC inputting to the other um, devices, but it technically is just a square wave going DC. It's not actually going into um, an AC formation. It's just going on and off. So it is DC. It's just pulsed. Okay, um, but there are um, a Tesla used AC. This is a bit different than his. I can give a um, description of the waveform. It is 40 hertz, there, it, but it is asymmetric also. Okay, there is an ideal for it. So technically, it is DC. It's just pulsed. Any other questions? Why does the field galvanize wires? Uh, good question. Because um, I will show that really quick. Why don't you come up here for a second? Okay, could you please? Does anyone have a pin, a needle, um, a small screwdriver, any of these pointed long iron materials? It needs to be something that's uh, got some iron in it. All sorts of things on the snipers. Need it to be a rod. I have one. I have one. Hold on. I know where one is. I will show you why. What's that? I guess we could try it. Oh. It's too big, though. It's almost as big as the face of it. I have a screwdriver. This is the best thing, because I was doing it earlier. Here we go. Come along this way. All right. Let's see if that may be better. I, no, it's not going to work. Thank you. I appreciate it, though. This will work fine. Thank you. OK. I will let you do it, but it may take a second. Before, I may have to show you how to do it. All right, magnet, go ahead and hold the magnet. All right, and we're bringing this towards the trajectory, OK? It's directly attracted to where? Center. As it comes in. Try to push it on the side of the rim there. Try to push it on the rim with your hand. Feel that. Where is it go? Can you push it onto the rim? Well, slide it. Approach it. Then it kind of follows the lines of force. Is it repelling it or is it being attracted? It's impossible to know. Yeah. Kind of is. It's kind of impossible to know. That is the uh, what is they're calling on the internet as the Jeff Cook effect. Thank you. The Jeff Cook effect is basically that, but inverted with a coil of iron. The iron is curled, and therefore it is repelled from the center of the magnetic pole. It is repelled from the poles, okay? So this is repelled from the edges because it is coming in line. You curl this, all you need is a, um, some iron wire, coil it up, make a coil, it will repel from the face. So well that I have many um, devices with that coil um, where I'm able to levitate, levitate magnets, pin them like a type 2 superconductor. Um, uh, anything that has, is spring-related technology can be replaced with one of these. Um, satellite um, docking bays, anything, because you can manipulate it with an electrical field, move that pinning point outward, keep the magnet stationary in that place. Speakers, they have, um, I did some prototypes, excellent fidelity, um, because you don't need a spider in the magnetic spider. Uh, I did uh, carbon-loaded, or the spring-loaded carbon brushes, Replace that with a coil, a cook coil, able to uh, um, work, work good for that. Um, that is the uh, um, purpose of the iron wire. It is that effect. And what happens is then when you wrap a copper, some copper wirings around that coil, the copper wirings want to place the pole of the magnet at the center, okay? But as we saw, the inverse of this will prevent that from happening. So what it does, as Volk was discussing, uh, Greg was discussing previously, it has to go somewhere. So it spirals outward. It is that which creates the rotating magnetic field. 
It is an excellent uh, experimental de device to demonstrate that um, with absolute proof that it is doing exactly as described, that the Jeff Cook effect is not an anomaly. It is not um, uh, my chi, okay? It is not, <laughs> um, it is something that is very real and measurable, okay? It is, um, it is that, that it actually, it will need to place the poles of the magnet outside for the electrical current to pass through the magnet. The rule of electrical magnets, which is the magnetic dipole, which is that coil, is that current cannot pass through the magnetic, through the coil until it creates a magnetic field. It can create a magnetic field by placing the poles on the side if you have the iron wires on the inside. So it has to spiral it. Therefore, you get a rotating magnetic field with a stationary coil, which hasn't been done before. Any other questions? One more? One more, thank you. Yes. Ah, good. Um, he uses, um, to the best of my knowledge, now I'm not an expert on, on what he's done, but to my knowledge, he uses AC magnetization for his rollers, right? I don't use the AC magnetization, which creates some sort of a spiraled uh, gear-like uh, phenomenon in there to capture that spin. Instead, what I do is I use regular magnets and spiral it like that. It doesn't spin like this. The magnetic field in those magnets is spiraled, so therefore it can spin on its axis that. I just rotate it like this and angle the magnets, the side magnets that will induce the electrical current in the inductive uh, coils. I angle that slightly counter to the angle that is tilted, and it's perfectly, those are spinning perfectly around. Okay, it's just a variation of that, but it does the same exact thing, uh, according to all of the theory. Ten minutes. Well, I'm I'm done actually. So um, I think I wanted to hurry through things. Um, well, I'm John. Leave some room. What's that? I'm John. You said you're done. I'm John. <laughs> we have a few moments for questions. Anybody? Uh, yeah. Just have, questions. Do you have any quick questions there? Well, I bounce out this mic here. Yeah. Um, uh, it, yeah uh, raise your hands. Okay. We got one here. Okay. Say your first name when you uh, when you uh, ask your question. Hi, I'm David. Uh, Nice presentation. Uh, is your intention to develop a Searle type device using uh, your technology? Actually, no, it, it's not. It is to uh, find out what's going on with the Searle technology more so. Um, I, I, I want to know what's going on with the gravity, okay? I want to know what's going on with energy. And all of the elements of Searle I've been able to get already from this experimental apparatus, except levitation, because I am using the exact opposite of levitation. I'm creating a strict gravitational field. It's not going to create the anti-gravity. However, if I had a number of those and flattened everything out and spun it at a very high velocity, it would do the same exact thing. Okay? It's not my intention to, um, uh, I'm not going into business with this. Um, I uh, mainly want to know. Yes, who else? Okay. Uh, my name is Igor. Uh, have you tried, uh, if it's possible, make anti-gravity devices? Yes, as, actually I tailed off at the end. It is very possible at a certain velocity, and um, I do not know what velocity that is because I'm testing a variety of different velocities. It is with a certain radius and velocity of that spin, it is, that will levitate according to the theory. So far everything else has matched the theory precisely. Yes. Ah, yes, let me do that. It is jeffreyncook.com. J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, not E-R-Y. R-E-Y, N as in Nathan, Cook, C-O-O-K.com. Jeffreyncook.com. And uh, the uh, <clears throat> videos, uh, I have a YouTube channel. You can link to it from the website. Just go to the website there. I think that will be there. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Cook. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's have a warm round of applause. And, uh, okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We're working on the